question. When you hear the name Herbert Hoover, what do you think of? Hooverville. Hooverville, places where all the poor people had to gather because they were homeless. Hoover Dam. Hoover Dam. He was part of the, the uh, legislation that, uh, that authorized that. Anything else? Great Depression. Great Depression, yeah. yeah. President. President of the United States. Yeah, we need to remember the important things. By the time I finish talking today, I hope that you will understand a lot more about Hoover, Hoover the man. Very plain family. His father was a blacksmith. His mother was a homemaker. Building he was born in, just two rooms, very small. Uh, born into a Quaker community. And uh, when he was five years old, he lost his father. When he was nine years old, he lost his mother. So he was orphaned by the age of nine, but as happens in, in communities of friends, in the Quaker community, he was uh, placed with some relatives there in the town for a while, but uh, eventually he was sent on to his mother's brother's house in Oregon, uh, was brought up essentially by his uncle. And as many, uh, many uh, Quaker children, he learned the values of hard work and honesty and, and uh, just all the, all the traits that, that, that are common uh, to that folks. So, yeah, thrift is one of them. Um, but uh, very, very intelligent young man, absolutely loved the outdoors. People ask him later on, uh, he, was, he was an outstanding student. People ask him what he liked to do when he was in school. He said, oh, I just, I wanted to get outside. <laughs> he said he paid attention in school, but he couldn't wait to get outdoors after he was done. So uh, he, he was the first truly Western president. The fact that he was born in Iowa and then moved to Oregon, he was educated, at Stanford University. He was in the very first graduating class from Stanford University. Fascinated by geology, fascinated by a lot of outdoor things, but geology is what he elected to study. And he graduated with a degree in mining engineering. He graduated from college. He went right to work for a mining company in China. or in, I'm sorry, in Australia. He went down to Australia and he did so well that they wound up moving him, promoting him one job to another to another finally wound up in China. Eventually he figured out that he was, he was so good at this mining work and so many other companies wanted his input that he would best be suited to kind of just become a consultant. That's what he did for most of his life. He was a mining engineer and a mining consultant. They referred to him as the doctor of sick mines. Uh, they wound up later on in their lives being in Europe at the time that World War I was breaking out. And this is where Herbert Hoover made uh, made some of his, uh, his you know, best impressions on people when he kind of came to the, to the attention of the world. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that when we get over to the Brown House. But uh, eventually, through the work that he did, Mr. Hoover was, was elected as President of the United States in 1928. And he won by the largest popular majority anyone had ever won by. He was an incredibly popular man through the 1920s in the United States. Within a few months of the time he got elected, the stock market crashed, banks began to fail. Not long after that, businesses began to fail. Of course, not too long after that, a lot of people wound up being out of work, on the streets, without money, homeless, hopeless. It was a very, very difficult time. When we talk about the Great Depression in America, I think a lot of times people focus on the financial part of it. But the, the 1920s was a time of just of great frivolity and hope and, you know, Post-World War I, we had all these uh, factories in place and, you know, all these wonderful new machines. You could get refrigerators, you could get stoves. We had American heroes like Charles Lindbergh. And there was just this kind of carefree exuberance about America and what we've got and what we can be. And even very average people were going out and investing in the stock market, borrowing money from banks because they could do it. And then they could buy bigger houses and they could buy automobiles. A lot of people buying automobiles in that time. But when the stock market crash occurred, it really caused this rapid downward uh, failure because banks had not been regulated in that time. Banks did not have to keep enough money to cover all of the deposits. That was part of that big booming economy. Banks didn't have much regulation. Businesses didn't have much regulation. So when the stock market crashed and the people who really needed some cash, well, they'd go to the bank. Well, after the banks ran out of cash, even though they had more depositors coming in and wanting money, they didn't have any more money. So the first people who got there got their money. The people who didn't goodness, were just suffering terribly because they, I mean, if you're business, you can't, you don't have money to buy stock, to pay your utilities, pay your rent, pay your employees. The people who are working for these places, all of a sudden they don't have jobs, so they can't pay rent and they're getting moved out of apartments and moved out of homes, dispossessed. 
So th there's this downward spiral. Everything that could go wrong was going wrong. And, if, and even if you think, well, you know, that was a wonderful time in American agriculture. You know, after, after uh, the Civil War and World War I, you know, mechanization, more land, you know, more people. We could grow more and more things. But there had been a series of droughts here in the, in, the, in the east, in the Midwest, and of course the Dust Bowl out in the west. So by the time Herbert Hoover became president, um, this, this wonderfully big, glorious balloon of hope and optimism and money and credit just popped and everything came crashing down. So depression was really, it was a, it was a spirit as much as anything else. Just people felt like, where am I going to go? What am I going to do? I can't, we don't have enough food don't have enough money. We've lost our furniture. That's been taken away. We've lost our homes. If you lived on a farm, everything you owned is gone. You live on a farm, where you live is not just your home, it's your place of work. So Herbert Hoover was in office for four of the worst years that any president could ever endure. Because of his uh, this uh, great skill that he had in organizing and motivating people and getting material to work for a project, uh, he was asked to come back and serve as the director of the U.S. Food Service. Never held elective office in his life. You know, he'd always been essentially a private businessman. So he came back to Washington and served under two presidents, uh, first as the director of the U.S. Food Service and eventually as secretary of the Commerce. One of the interesting things was 1925, 1926, the economy was just really heating up. You know, the stock market was just booming. Uh, banks were doing real well because, again, you know, this easy credit. You know, even people who really couldn't afford credit were going to get it. And as Secretary of Commerce, he said, you know, we, we need to regulate some of these things. We need to cool this off or we're really headed for trouble. You think very many politicians in a booming economy want to impose regulations or taxes or limit business? Not if you want to get reelected. So essentially, it, the, his warnings fell on deaf ears. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was the governor of New York. And Mr. Hoover even went to him and said, you know, look, you're the governor. Is there any way that you can regulate the stock market so we'll avoid some of these possible pitfalls. Not, don't want anything to do with that. Uh, Mr. Roosevelt, like a lot of other people, had a lot of money in the stock market. People were doing very well by it. So the association that people have with Hoover and the Depression is usually a completely incorrect one. He was trying to do the things ahead of time that would have avoided it. He just happened to be the president at the time that it all fell in. So, and uh, a lot of the presidents that had, had been in office up to that time were people who lived in the Midwest or the East, and they had, uh, they had cottages or mansions or place, places that they could go uh, for kind of a retreat, but Hoover didn't. So when he was elected in 1928, uh, Mr. Lewis Ritchie, who was his personal secretary, he said, uh, I want you to go, to go to Washington, I want you to find me a place where I can have a retreat, a place I can get away from Washington, the city, and, and just concentrate and fish and relax and do things like that. I have three requirements. First thing, it does have to be within 100 miles of Washington, D.C., so he has proximity to the city. Second reason, the uh, second thing is it has to be above 2,500 feet. Anybody guess the reason for that? Yeah. No, 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 they believe that there are no mosquitoes, gnats, and bugs above 2,500 feet. I can vouch for the fact that that is not correct, <laughs> but he thought that if, as long as we were above 2,500 feet, we're good. The third condition, there had to be good trout fishing. He absolutely loved to fish, and that was what Mr. Ritchie was told, find a place like that. Well, during this time, you remember we were talking earlier about this law that was passed in 1926. Congress said, we're, well, if we can get two big donations of land, we'll establish national parks. Immediately, Virginia got a commission set up, and they were trying to lobby this group to make the Virginia Blue Ridge Mountains, where some of these small private resorts had been, the uh, one of the two national parks. And uh, the uh, kind of the chairman of that organization went to Mr. Ritchie and said, "I hear that the president is looking for a retreat. I've got a place that we'd like to show you. Some really pretty land up in the Blue Ridge. It's within 100 miles of Washington. It's above 2,500 feet. Why don't you come on out and look?" Well, Mr. Ritchie was so impressed that he cabled uh, Mr. Hoover and said, uh, I think we found a place. Would you like to come out and see it? So Mr. Hoover came out and said, this is just perfect. Two little streams that come across the mill prong here and the laurel prong here, they join to form the headwaters of the Rapidan River. And Mr. Hoover said, that's exactly where I want my house to be built, right there at that junction. So 1929, they started construction here. And uh, we're going to walk around and take a look at some of that. Any questions before we...
Go on, our comments. Yeah, was, it, was that done with his own personal money or was that government money? That's a wonderful question. That's what I'm going to I'm going to talk. It was almost exclusively his personal money. Okay. But the Commonwealth of Virginia had set aside $100,000 to buy the land, build the build everything that the president wanted to have here because they thought what what better way to anchor a new national park but to have the president's retreat here. Very smart thinking. Mr. Hoover had already been out here and, and looked at the land and really liked it and he found out he was told by Mr. Ritchie that Congress had set aside forty five thousand dollars to uh, construct some some proper you know a, a place for the president to use. So $145,000 was available at his disposal, and he said, I, I don't want any of that. I'm, I'm going to do it on my own. Uh, you remember I talked about his success as a mining consultant. He was a self-made millionaire before he turned 30 because of his skill as a mining geologist. And again, he came from a very modest background and, you know, that people who, people who worked hard for their money and, and spent carefully. So he said, I don't see any reason why the, the people of Virginia or the people of the country should have to pay for my land. I'm going to buy the land, and I'm going to buy all the building supplies for what we decide to put in there, and I'd like to pay for the people who put it up. Well, at that time, they said, no, no, wait, Mr. President, we've got Marines who we're trying to train in the, in the prompt and, and good at construction of buildings. They really need this practice. They're going to be out there anyway because they're going to be securing the site for you, and if you don't have them do the work for you, we're just going to assign them some other place. We'd, we'd like to have them go to work there. So Mr. Hoover did acquiesce, and he didn't pay for himself, was using the Marines to construct the, uh, the buildings down here. Over the four years he was here, he spent over $100,000 of his personal funds to build and support and maintain the buildings and the activities and the other things that were around here. Because his belief was, and it's a Quaker belief, those who have done well should try to help others should do as much as they possibly can to take care of folks, especially people in need. That was, that was just a, a part of his core. That's the way he'd been raised. And I have discovered that even the work of government can be improved by leisurely discussion out under the trees. I need not extol to you the joys of outdoor life, its values and relaxation, and its contribution to real and successful work. The reason he wanted to have a camp here he wanted to have a retreat, a place that he could get away to, but he also wanted a place where he could get people away from the boardrooms and, the, and the, uh, the, the congressional meeting places in Washington, get people out where they were calm and quiet and relaxed. And he felt like that was the best way to get the government's work done. But his philosophy was, if, you're, if your mind and your heart, your spirit are, are, are at peace and calm, then you will make the very best choices that you can. You'll give the very best advice that you possibly can. Again, it goes back to his upbringing and his faith. And he thought this is where the government's business should be developed and taken care of. You know, Mr. Hoover believed in the sound of moving water. He thought that the sound of, of a stream or a river had a, had a very calming effect on people's spirits. So the one thing that you'll find in, in this area that's not natural is this little stream that we're going to cross in a few minutes. He directed the Marines to build a little check dam a little further up the stream and divert some water, not all of it, but some of the water to come right down through here. This is called Hemlock Run, and it's because in this particular area where some buildings were, you could still hear running water, and that was very important to Mr. Hoover.